This is January, and um, this means uh, it's time again for us to seek the Lord through uh, fasting and prayer. Those of you that have been a part of Triumph know that this is a, a custom, very much a part of our culture and our pattern of operation, and I look forward to leading you in that again this year. We launch next Sunday, and it will conclude the first Sunday in February. And so you may ask, Pastor, why is it that every January you lead us in 21 days of fasting and prayer? There's three good reasons for that. The first reason is the first fruits principle or the principle of first things. And that is this, that all first things belong to God. All first things belong to God. And so this is the first month of the year. And so we give ourselves in the first month of the year to the Lord through fasting and prayer. It's a principle. It's the first month. And so we dedicate this month to seek Him, to spend time with Him in prayer and devotion during this month. Secondly, it's a new year, a new beginning. Um, and it's important that we have direction for the year. Now, I, I'm assuming that all of you know that, that when you seek the Lord in private devotion and prayer and c couple that with a fast, um, it's an opportunity for you to hear what God is saying to you for the coming year, to get strength and courage and direction, to get some kind of a word in your spirit that gives you an impetus or gives you a direction and momentum for the year. And so when you seek the Lord in this 21 days, you're asking Him for direction. You're asking Him for strength and grace and courage and, and maybe solutions. Uh, maybe you have some situations you just feel like you need a solution for. Uh, that's what the 21 days is all about. The third reason is, is because during this time you increase spiritual strength, you increase faith, and you just simply come closer to God. In James chapter 4, verse 8, the, the apostle said, come close to God, and he will come close to you. Come close to God. You initiate time with him. You initiate the meeting. You initiate the appointment. And when you come close to God, he will come close to you. So based on this, I will say to you unequivocally and without doubt that if you will dedicate some time in prayer and reading your Bible every day for 21 days, that God will come near you because it's been your desire to come near to Him. Come close to God, and He will come close to you. I just feel like that if we can do January right, we can gain momentum for the rest of the year. That if we can gain some strength in January, that strength will help us throughout the year. And uh, I want to encourage you to dedicate yourself to fasting and prayer. There's three elements of how we do this. First of all, every day we have a Pray 21, 21 minutes of live prayer on Facebook. And um, it's a, a private group because we pray for people and their needs, and we pray openly and fervently. So it's not like a broadcast to the whole world, but it is certainly very effective. And I'd like for you to plan on joining us again this season with Pray 21. Secondly, a daily devotion is so very helpful. Uh, I use a daily devotion, usually more than one, every day of my life. I'm reading a devotion. Um, I use uh, a number of tools. My primary tool is Uversion. If you haven't discovered Uversion, you need to catch up with the rest of the world and get Uversion on your app. And first of all, get that verse a day. That verse a day is, is important. It's amazing how many days the verse of that day, which I suppose the same verse is sent out to 388 million people to, uh, all over the world. And it's amazing how that verse for that day so perfectly fits what I need for my day. It's just an amazing thing. So you version is important. There's a lot of great devotional plans there. Uh, many of them are audio where you can listen to them on your drive time. Others you read, but it's all good. Various translations, various subjects, and that would be a good place to go. We are going to provide you with a devotional next Sunday. We have chosen a devotional from the book of Psalms. That will be a huge blessing to you. If you don't find one, we have one for you. And then finally, fasting has to, prayer has to be coupled with fasting. And every year we do something a little bit different. Um, 
you know, because my pastor growing up always did um, Daniel's fast. I grew up doing a Daniel's fast in January for as long as I could remember. A few years ago, I calculated that I've done Daniel's fast in January for like 50 years. <laughs> And I just decided 50 years was enough, and I started making some changes and, and uh, still fasting, but not doing it just like we'd always done it. Um, this year, I want to encourage you to do something that is healthy for you physically and spiritually. Couple your fast with where you are physically and maybe some goals that you have personally for your health. So what I'm saying is instead of us saying we're all going to do this, and we're not going to eat that, uh, I want to encourage you to tailor these 21 days to something that is healthy physically and spiritually. So make this a sanctified diet, a sanctified effort to upgrade your eating habits, your exercising habits, your resting habits. Just make this an opportunity to upgrade. You know, if you get a hold of your eating habits and you improve in that area of your life, it will give you strength in every other area of your life. And so there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm fasting slash dieting. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I'm going to alter my diet and I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. Because fasting is not meant to torment you, it is meant to increase your spiritual health. So the whole concept of fasting is not torture, but the concept of fasting is improving your spiritual strength and health. So as you're improving spiritual strength, improve your physical uh, strength. Now all over the America, maybe the world, uh, people in January commit to diets and different health uh, goals to try to say, I want to be better. So this just flows right with that. It's not contradictory. It, it isn't uh, um, in any way carnal or fleshly to say that, you know what, I believe God wants me healthy spiritually and physically, and for 21 days, I'm going to couple those together. So you design something where you are today that will move you forward and help you gain spiritual and physical strength. Can you say amen? So that starts next Sunday. Get wound up, get ready, be praying about what you're going to do, think about how you're going to structure it, and sometimes it helps for households to get on the same page, uh, husbands and wives to get on the same page. It certainly helps around mealtime. So God bless you so very much. Are you with me here today? Yes. All right, uh, let's see. I'm ready to start teaching the Word. Did you bring your Bible with you? Hold up your Bible. If you don't have a, a, a leather-bound Bible, hold up your phone or your iPad because it's all there. Um, God bless you very much. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, since you listen to me on a regular basis, um, I've been using more the New Living Translation. I really enjoy it. I'm using it for my daily devotion. And um, I find it to be very helpful as a teacher. Uh, sometimes when I use the uh, older translations, I have to retranslate it. And when I'm using the New Living Translation, I don't have to retranslate it for the modern world. And so um, just so you'll know, I'm reading more and more out of the New Living Translation. I will go back and forth to the New King James Version from time to time. Second Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. Let's read. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Can you say amen? I want you to notice a portion of this verse here. First of all, it says, the Lord is not, isn't really being slow about His promise. Have you ever felt like a promise was really slow in coming to pass? Like it really is taking a lot of time? It really shouldn't take the God of the universe this long to get it done. I mean, He created this whole thing. Does it really take this long? And so Peter said, God isn't really being slow 
to fulfill a promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. There's a process at work. There's always a process connected to a promise. And if you're not willing to work the process, you might not ever receive the promise. A process takes time. A process is systematic. A process is step after step after step. And I'm wanting to get to the end of the process. But you see, God has a process that's going to improve me in my situation. And if he cuts it short by bringing the promise to pass too early, then he's cut short the process. No, he's making me wait because there is a process at play. And when the process is finished, I'm going to be a better person, I'm going to be in a better place, and I'm going to be glad he made, it, made me wait. You and I need to be reminded that God will do everything he promised and will accomplish everything he originally desired. So when all this thing wraps up, the whole essence of creation and the human race and human history, when it's all climaxes, God will have fulfilled every promise, done everything he said he was going to do, and he will have accomplished everything he started. Listen, this project called the human race is not some massive divine failure. This is The redemptive plan is not a B plan, it's still the A plan. It's what God saw from the beginning, and he is carefully working it out. We believe in the providence of God. The providence of God is the overriding authority of God. You see, we are all given free will and free choice. And by our own free will, we shape our lives, and we color our lives, and we determine our future. But the providence of God is over and above that. And even when you and I are making our decisions, some right, some wrong, some in between, God's providence overrides that and he still brings things about according to his plan and his purpose in the earth. Sometimes poor choices on my part can delay the promise, but God's still faithful to fulfill fulfill the promise. Because God is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. As we close one year and open anew, I'm reminded of of a phrase in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah is um, empathizing with the people of Israel. And he is quoting them and describing their frame of mind at that point in Jeremiah chapter 8. And as he is uh, describing the mental and spiritual condition of God's people, listen to what he said. The people are crying, the harvest is finished and the summer is gone. The people cry, yet we are not saved. The harvest is finished, the summer's gone, and yet we are not saved. I want to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about unfulfilled expectations. You know, each and every year, we start the year with great hopes and great dreams and plans and goals, and then 12 months later, that same year comes to a close. And year after year, I look at back at my list of goals, purposes, and intents, and I realize that part of the list happened and part of the list didn't happen. I look back at my personal prayer list of things that I prayed for and believed for, and some of them have great big check marks beside them, and others of them are just blank because I didn't get the answers to those prayer in the context of 2018. So when you close a year, you close it with somewhat mixed emotions of thanksgiving for what did happen and a little bit of disappointment for what didn't happen. Unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled expectations. And so when we start this new year, we have to make certain that those unfulfilled expectations do not damper or cloud our view of this year. 
I mean, you can look at what God didn't get done, what processes that weren't finished, what prayers that weren't answered, what promises didn't happen, and you can say, well, there's no use this year. Unfulfilled expectations can rob your joy, steal your hope, and give you a dim view of the future. So my way is let's just face them and say, God did some wonderful things for me last year, but he didn't do everything I wanted him to do. You see, God doesn't necessarily work on our calendar. Like, okay, God, you got to have this done by the end of December. He doesn't always work like that. I mean, I think God arranged all the changing of the season and the calculating of the years of our life, but it doesn't mean that December 30th worth is God's cutoff time. That all of a sudden a buzzer rings and, and the game's over and he's out of time. God just keeps working right through the new, the, the new Year's Eve and right into the new year. Can you say amen? amen. So face your unex, unfulfilled ex, expectations. In the book of Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred, hope deferred, a promise delayed, a desire that was not completely fulfilled, something you reached for, worked for, uh, labored for, believed for, prayed for, confessed with everything you had, but still the year came and went and it did not happen. Hope was deferred, and he said it makes the heart sick. So again, I said we just face it. If there's some big things that didn't happen, if there's some important things you had hoped for that somehow didn't change or didn't get right or didn't happen or didn't come through, face it, it causes your heart to be sick. But it doesn't mean you're going to die. You can get sick but not die. You can get sick and get over it. Your body has healing already built in it, and as soon as your body gets sick or cut or injured, automatically, instantly it starts to heal itself. Okay, so you're a little heart sick about something. Maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a job opportunity. Maybe it was a financial breakthrough. Maybe it was a healing in your own body. Maybe you're a little heart sick because hope was deferred. The word deferred doesn't mean never, ever. It just means not now. And so when you face that, you say, you know what? I feel a little heart sick, but it's not terminal. Hope has been deferred, but it's been delayed, but it has not been destroyed. I still believe God. Can you say amen? amen? You see, the testing of our faith is in the waiting, the enduring. You know, you, do, you can't have faith and see your faith grow if you don't have those waiting periods. The period of waiting and enduring is critical to the strengthening of your faith. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a great chance to grow. Everybody say endurance. endurance. Now, we all want character and we want personal attributes and we want to be great, strong, wonderful people, but we don't often ask for endurance because the only way you can build endurance is very painful, very slow, very methodically. It's a great cost. And James said that if you want your faith to grow, it's going to involve some endurance. I mean, I don't even like the word endurance. Who wants to endure anything? I can't think of anything I want to endure. I mean, the whole word sounds like hurt and pain and disappointment and, and waiting and, and, and wanting it to pass, but it won't pass. The whole word sounds like that to me. But you know, endurance is one of the major qualities of God, characteristics of God. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Endurance. And so waiting is a primary part of growing our faith. He said, for so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. At this point in my life, I just want to say, how long does it take to fully develop my endurance? 
how long is it going to take? Like at my age, am I still working on in my endurance coming to full maturity? I'm sure it is. Maybe I'm a slow learner. I don't know. And then again, maybe this is just a part of life. And maybe the oldest and most faith-filled people among us are still enduring something and they're reaching for something in the future that has not yet come to pass. Be encouraged with the Word of God today. So we close a year, open a new one, and we realize that a lot of good things happened, a few things bad happened, and and other things didn't come to pass. Promises were not fulfilled. Hopes were not realized. And uh, we're facing a new year, and so we face it with faith. And we say again, I still believe. Okay, 18 was what it was, but 19 is a new year, and I still believe. Let me give you another biblical portrait of what I'm saying. John 11, 20 through 23, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, two sisters, a brother. Lazarus gets sick, he dies. He gets sick. They send for Jesus. He was just a few miles away at another village. And they said, come quick. Lazarus is sick, and they tell us he's going to die. Jesus delayed. He did not rush. He, he purposely delayed. And he allowed Lazarus, his friend, to die. And then after he had been dead a few days, he sort of casually walked into town. Mary and Martha met him upon the entrance to his city. And Martha, when she got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you'd have gotten here before he died, I know you wouldn't have let him die. If you'd have been here, we wouldn't have had to have the funeral and we wouldn't have buried my brother. But look at verse 22. But even now, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And so when hope has been deferred, expectations have not been fulfilled, And your faith has been tried by waiting and waiting and waiting. We have to say like Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, I know you would have healed him. But you weren't here and he did die. But even now, I know. And so as we step into this new year, let's say as Martha said, even now, Lord, I know you are faithful. Even now, Lord, I still believe. Even now, Lord, I know you're going to do everything you told me you were going to do, and you're going to fulfill all of your word. Even now, Lord, I still believe. All of us fight the unrelenting battle against doubt. If you are battling doubt, don't think yourself strange or weak or somehow especially targeted by the enemy. There's not a human on this planet that doesn't battle the unrelenting thoughts and feelings of doubt. Satan inspires doubt. Our environment encourages doubt. Our very human nature, our flesh, encourages doubt. Your spirit, man, must stand up against Satan, your environment, the world around you, and your own flesh and refuse doubt. It is an unrelenting battle. And it doesn't matter how many miracles God does for you or how many years you live for God, you're still going to have a battle with doubt. Now, there's some areas of your life and mine I battle a lot of doubt, and there's other areas of my life I don't battle much doubt at all. Each of us have those areas we feel like we have the upper hand on, and we have other areas of our life that we're struggling with, and doubt is flooding our minds. But understand, because you're being bombarded with unrelenting doubt does not mean that there's something wrong with you. It just means you're alive, you're breathing, you're a human being, you're a child of God, and this is the battle of faith versus doubt. So stand strong. Skepticism. 
Skepticism is embracing doubt as an attitude or a general perspective. So we're all facing this unrelenting battle against doubt. But if it becomes a part of me attitudinally, then it's skepticism. God help us to battle the battle against doubt without it becoming a part of our general perspective and our outlook and our, and our normal response to life and not become skeptic in our view of life, our response to life, but to continue to stand in faith and believe the Lord. There was a man in the Bible in Luke 9 and 24 that had a son that was sick and, and uh, he came to Jesus and Jesus said to him, if you believe, anything's possible. And this man spoke for all of us in these, these words. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Can you say amen? So we all have a battle against doubt. Nobody escapes. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's left. Some areas it's more, some areas it's left. But we're all fighting the battle against doubt. And we're right where this man was. Lord, I believe, but help me overcome unbelief. And that's what doubt is, unbelief. God healed that man's son. God healed him, and it was good. Because he realized that he did have faith, but he was also in a battle of doubt. And he said, Lord, I I do believe. I know I believe. Don't let the devil talk you out of your faith. Don't let the devil talk you into giving up. Don't let the devil mess your mind up. Just say, Lord, I know I have faith. I do believe. Just help me overcome my unbelief. How many of you want God's help to overcome your unbelief? Not only are there unrelenting battles against doubt, there's unchangeable circumstances. One of the things we face is that life happens, things happen, and it seems as though the promise can't or won't ever come to pass. And so we are always separating what is final and what still can change. And we know that there are some final things that happen that life has been altered and it probably never will be that way again. It's been changed. And yet, there are other things that even though we don't know how they can change, they can change. And we don't know how God is going to do it, but He still can do it. Never limit God with your own personal list of options and solutions. You know, sometimes we're like this. You know what? If I can think of a way God could do it, then I can believe He will. But if I can't think of a way for him to do it, if I can't think of a solution, if I don't see any way it could all come together, then sometimes it's hard for me to believe. It's like the human being in me wants to see an opportunity, a possibility, an avenue. This could happen and that could happen. And if all that happened, then, yeah, I can see where God could do it. And if I don't have that possible scenario in my mind, it's like, I just don't believe God's going to do it. So the challenge is, don't ever limit God to your list of ideas and solutions and scenarios that somehow could add up to the answer to your prayer. God has ways and ideas and solutions. He can do things you will never think of, and He can bring things together that you would never imagine. God has answered hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of my prayers, but a very few happened how I prayed them, or happened when I thought they would be ha- they would happen. The how and the when, it seems like more and more I get it wrong every time. And I'm like this, okay, God, I want you to do this, and this is how I want you to do it, and this is when I want you to do it. And so I may not just believe in God, but I'm helping him out because he needs suggestions. He needs ideas, and he needs plans, and I'm a planner, so I'm like, God, here's how you can do this, and here's when it would be best for you to do that. And he just goes silent. He always ignores my plans. He never wants to do things when I want to do things. I just have to trust and believe him, Lord, your way is better than my way, 
Your ideas are so much higher than mine. Your timing is perfect. Mine stinks. And if you do it my way, God, I know it's going to be a mess. You do it when I want it done, it's going to be the wrong time every time. You just have to give that to God and let him take over. Can you say amen? Amen. Abraham was the father of the faithful. He's the father of us all. And in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, it said, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Let me remind you of the story. God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and of this son, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed, and I'm going to use this son to build a whole nation, would ultimately become the nation of Israel. And then God said, I want you to take this son who was now full grown. We believe that he would have been about 30 or 33 at that time, same age as Christ when he was crucified. And uh, Abraham um, said, it said to Abraham, I want you to take this son up on that mountain and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. Take some wood, take some fire, take some rope to bind his hands, take a knife and I want you to plunge it in his heart and offer him as a human sacrifice to me. Abraham had so much faith in God, he climbed that mountain with Isaac, bound his hands, laid him on a crude altar, and raised the knife, literally the Bible says, to plunge it in his heart and take the life of the son, the son that was going to give birth to a whole nation, the only son that was going to be blessed and was going to be used of God. And Abraham raises the knife to take his life. And the Hebrews dis, dis, uh, explains how that Abraham had so much faith. He believed that if God told me to kill him, I will kill him and God will bring him back to life. That's why he's the father of the faithful. Because he believed that even if Isaac died, God would bring him back to life. And that's why he's... Um, called the father of the faithful the fact is we cannot limit God we just have to trust and believe God and walk by faith and believe that if it makes no sense to me nor to you or anyone else it makes perfect sense to God and somehow he will bring it all around can you say amen, amen. so hold on to hope and don't lose your faith now I know I've given you a number of verses here so I want to give you one more and I'll be finished for today Romans 15 13 I pray that God, the source of hope, everybody say the source of hope. If you want to have hope in your life, you need to know who the source of hope is. The source of hope. When you draw near to God through fasting and prayer, you're drawing near to the source of hope. If you want more hope, ask for hope at the source. Who will, uh, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow, circle that word overflow, with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's where I want, that's what I want. I want to overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to confident, I want to overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you want to overflow with confident hope? Confident hope. So the incoming of the Holy Spirit allows me to overflow, to overflow in hope. Let's stand together. Thank you, Father. Now, as we close here today, this portion of our service, I pray for the Holy Spirit to overshadow us and each of us and infuse you with power, confident hope, confident hope to overflow. As you look at this coming year, you look at it through faith and courage and hope. Hold on to hope. Hope is the womb from which faith is born. And if you lose your hope, you lose your faith. And if you hold on to your hope, your faith will continue to grow. But I'm asking the Holy Spirit to give you hope. I couldn't possibly know all the situations of your lives, the scenarios that you're facing. 
I said a few things today that seemed to strike home. I felt it reverberate when it hit you in the heart. But I don't really know what's going on. But the Holy Spirit does. And I feel the closeness of His presence right now. And I believe that He's going to overshadow us and cause us to begin to overflow. As you step into this year, to, to this new season of your life, as we step into this new season as a church, I pray that God's Holy Spirit would cause us to overflow. So hold your hands out like this. Will you do that for me? It's like if you were going to receive a gift, if somebody was going to hand you something, somebody was going to impart something to you, just open up your hands. Father, we receive from your Spirit an overflow of confident hope. Infuse us with faith, joy, peace, and hope. If there's any here today that are deeply discouraged and despondent, disappointed, for anyone that might be heart sick, I pray that they'd be healed today by the Holy Spirit that you have overshadowed us with. Heal their heart, O oh God. Fill them with joy, peace, and hope. In Jesus' name. Now just kind of close your hands as if you say, okay, I, I got that. Thank you very much. Take it home with you. Let it alter your conversation, your whole perspective. Begin to look at the year through new eyes with an overflowing, confident hope. Can you say amen? Let's give the Lord a hand praise.